This is a story about a revolution. On June 14, 1979, a red sports car is found crashed near a tunnel in northern Afghanistan. People gather around and three men emerge from the car without a scratch on them. One person inside the car is dead and the people immediately recognize him. His name is Ahmad Zahir. He is the most famous pop star in all of Afghanistan. That day they call Ahmad's wife and let her know that her husband has died. The official cause of death given by the government is that he died in a car accident. But the witnesses tell his wife there was just one strange thing about that. He had a bullet hole in his head. Ahmad Zahir was born in Kabul, Afghanistan in 1946. He was born on the same day he ended up dying, June 14th. His father was Dr. Abdul Zahir, who was a physician in the royal court of the King of Afghanistan. Afghanistan was a monarchy then, but a lot of people in the country, including Ahmad Zahir's father, were pushing for modernization. Dr. Zahir actually helped write a constitution for the country in 1964. Then from 1971 to 1972, he actually served as the country's prime minister. Ahmad had showed an interest in the arts at an early age. He loved music and poetry. He taught himself how to play the guitar and the accordion by the time he was 16. And his father had encouraged his son's passions, but there was still a stigma on being a musician, and that's not what he wanted for his son. Ahmad attended Habibia High School and started a band with some friends. Even in high school, he was renowned for his voice. They called him babul e habibia which meant the Nightingale of Habibia. But not wanting to disappoint his father, Ahmad tried to go into a different career. He studied teaching, first in Kabul, and then he moved to Mumbai, India, and got a degree in teaching English. In the 1960s, he moves back to Afghanistan and gets a job as a reporter, working for the Kabul Times. But he realizes he's not going to be happy doing anything besides being a musician. And a friend of his who is a singer actually writes a letter to Ahmad's father telling him that Ahmad has all this potential and that he's going to be a great musician. And it actually convinces Ahmad's father and he gives him his blessing to try to make it as a musician. Ahmad releases his first album in 1967 and he's playing anywhere he can around Afghanistan at parties and in restaurants. And he starts to become really successful. For one thing, he is a very talented musician and is very unique. He has this haunting baritone voice that people love, and people love his lyrics, which draw from a lot of Persian poetry. And then his musical style, he's combining Western rock and roll and pop music with Indian music and Afghan folk music. Visually, he looks great. He has these big sideburns and wears flashy suits. People start calling him the Elvis of Afghanistan. And he's also hitting at the perfect time in the history of Afghan society. That modernization that people like his father had pushed for was starting to come into effect. Fashion was changing with women wearing mini skirts. They were also fighting for equal rights, something that Ahmad supported. There was a vibrant nightlife scene in Kabul with discos and live music clubs. And Ahmad Zahir was in the center of it all. He went from singing in restaurants to singing at hotels to eventually singing at sports stadiums, something that no singer in Afghanistan had ever done before him. By his second album, he had ascended to superstardom, the first pop superstar in Afghanistan. His music was all over the radio. He toured all over the country, but also neighboring countries, Iran, Uzbekistan, even Russia. In 1972, he was named Singer of the Year in Afghanistan. His career couldn't have been going better. But things in Afghanistan were not going good and were about to get a lot worse. In 1973, there was a military coup that ended the monarchy in Afghanistan. The king who Ahmad Zahir's father had served under was removed by his own cousin. But Ahmad remained mostly apolitical. His songs were love songs. And it was actually at one of his concerts that he spotted a woman in the front row who would become his wife. Her name was Fakria, and he wrote a note on a napkin to give to her. They ended up meeting and eventually getting married. Fakria said that despite being such a massive celebrity, he lived a very normal life. He liked having small get-togethers with family and spent most of his time reading books of poetry. He would mark up these books of poetry looking for inspiration for his songs. <laughs> But then in 1978, there was a bloody revolution in Afghanistan called the Saar Revolution. This Marxist group took over the country, killed a lot of the current people in power, and instituted social repression throughout the country. And now Ahmad Zahir knew that he couldn't be apolitical anymore. He refused to publicly support the revolution, and so he was blacklisted from the radio. He started writing songs with lyrics like, If submission were a must, there's no need for living. He was harassed and received death threats daily, and then finally, on June 14th, 1979, he was killed. 
Millions of people attended his funeral. It was the biggest in the history of Afghanistan. But even more tragic than his mysterious death was that his wife, Fakria, was eight months pregnant. In fact, when she got the news of her husband's death, she was so distraught that she went into labor early and her and Ahmad Zahir's daughter, Shabnam, was born that day, June 14th, 1979. Fakria and Shabnam were immediately placed under house arrest by the government and Fakria was scared for her life. Luckily, Fakria had some connections. She had previously worked at the US Embassy in Kabul and a friend of hers who still worked there was able to arrange for her to seek asylum in the US. In 1980, Fakria and Shabnam got on a plane, then went to Rome, and then to the United States. Fakria moved to Alexandria, Virginia. She was able to get a job at the Oman Embassy. She also took on a second job as a clerk at a department store, and she continued to live there anonymously for decades. Every once in a while, people would ask her to make an appearance to speak about her husband, but she remained scared for her life for years and never made any public appearances. Some of Ahmad Zahir's other relatives had also made it to the United States. A son from a previous marriage, Rashad, also made it to the United States and became a musician when he grew up. Ahmad's sister, Zahira Zahir, had actually moved to New York in the 1970s and then had relocated to the Washington, D.C. area. She was a beautician and eventually opened her own salon in the Watergate Hotel and became Ronald Reagan's hairdresser. Shabnam is now working on a documentary about her father's life. As Shabnam grew up, she eventually started asking questions about her father and learned about his legacy. Not only did people love his music and consider him the greatest musician in Afghanistan history, he also became a symbol of what Afghanistan was before it was plunged into decades of war. Fakria, now in her 70s, said, We're the ones who've seen beautiful Afghanistan. It was peaceful. She was only married to Ahmad Zahir for three years. He died on his 33rd birthday. But she said those three years were the greatest of her life. When she fled Afghanistan to come to the United States, the only things she took with her were Ahmad Zahir's poetry books. Now, 40 years later, she says it's one of the only things she has left that still connects her to him. She looks through the books and sees his handwritten notes coming up with ideas for new songs, songs that Ahmad Zahir never got to write. Extra or never